Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. So a uh, customer brought in this uh, Oberheim OBX 8-voice uh, synthesizer that he purchased as a broken unit. Um, and uh, I started working on it and I realized I probably haven't done any OBX videos yet, so I thought I'd uh, start recording and uh, show you what's going on inside one of these. Uh, so when it came in, it was uh, basically, dead, for all intents and purposes, dead. Uh, the, the lights would turn on and you could change the buttons and it would cycle through the voices. Uh, but there was like a, a, the only sound you could get out of it was like a, a, a hum, a ground loop type of, of hum. And uh, I opened it up and I took a look at it and uh, I found that the uh, minus 19 and minus 15 volt rails were shorted. And I corrected that and now it's, it's come back to life and mostly is working. <laughs> Um, and uh, probably a good clue that, that the, uh, there was a short was that it came with this uh, big sack of uh, negative voltage rail regulators which they were probably burning up like crazy uh, not realizing they, they had a short. Uh, so now that the keyboard is, is up and, and mostly running but there's a couple issues which I'll show you. So the first issue is the uh, <coughs> the bushings need to be replaced. You can hear that it's quite the keyboard is quite noisy. Uh, second issue is uh, the key contacts need to be cleaned. The bus bar you can hear it, it loses contact and, sw <coughs> and switches to the next voice card, and that's a key contact and bus bar issue. So we we will be refurbishing the keyboard. We'll pull this out. We'll clean the bus bar, we'll change the bushings, and, and those problems should go away. Uh, the other issue is uh, one of the, the voices. This hasn't been calibrated or anything like that, so I wouldn't expect it to be in tune. But one of the eight voices is, is very far off from what it should be. Um, so let's open it up and have a look inside. So I've opened up the OBX and you get in the same way that you get in on the OB, other OB series. There's two screws here on each side that you remove and then you can fold the, the lid up. And uh, there's two boards on the top that have the pots and uh, buttons. And a ribbon cable down here to the processor board. Or the control board is on the bottom and the processor board is on the top. The top board is a lot smaller than on the other OB series ones. Uh, this particular one is fitted with a JL Cooper memory expansion, so it has some ribbon cables that go to the memory chips, or where the memory chips would be, and it adds additional banks of patch storage. So there's a cable that runs along here to this little uh, panel, which has some buttons that you can press and switch between banks of patch storage. Uh, the power supply is on the left, and like the other OB series, there's little uh, connectors that lead to... Uh, off-board voltage regulators or pass transistors that are mounted here on heat sinks on the back of the case. Uh, this is an eight voice, uh, so it has two motherboards, each with four voice cards. Uh, this one uses more discrete circuitry than the other OB series ones, although there's still a couple of Curtis chips here for the envelopes. Um, and the key bed and the bender box, uh, very similar to the other OB series synthesizers. So one thing that I noticed uh, when uh, examining the inside of this is uh, over here on the right side of the control board uh, there, there's quite a bit of corrosion uh, on the, uh, the, 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 the pads there uh, for the chips and I can see corrosion in the IC sockets both at the top of the board and the bottom of the board. And actually, one of these uh, quad op amps at the top, in the top right of the board, is uh, missing a leg. And these control the control voltages that are sent to each of the voice cards. So it's very conceivable that with a damaged op amp here, one of the voices would not be getting the correct control voltage and therefore be much higher pitched than the rest. Uh, regardless, uh, this corrosion needs to be cleaned up. And from taking a close look at it, uh, there appears to be a mouse dropping there. Um, so this is, is probably mouse P. Uh, mouse P is, is, has the same effect as like a leaked alkaline battery. It's a strong base, 
So uh, it's going to eat away the copper traces until it's neutralized. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to strip uh, the affected areas of the board. Uh, so all the IC sockets and resistors and stuff will come out. The tropical fish capacitors there, I'm going to try to, to salvage. I'm going to try to leave them in place. Uh, but all this stuff in the top corner of the board and all this stuff in the bottom corner of the board is going to need to come out and be replaced. The yeah, power supply is original with the exception of a, a replaced battery here that someone kind of hacked into place. Um, so well, we're going to rebuild the power supply. Like the other OB series, it uses a, a pretty underrated bridge rectifier here. Um, there's two of them. And the kit that I offer uh, for the OBX power supply rebuild kit includes two new bridge rectifiers which are uh, rated about six times higher than the ones that are there, so it, it's going to be able to handle the load a lot better. Uh, and then we're going to replace these old capacitors, these four old capacitors, and all the little tantalum capacitors that are there. Uh, since uh, there's a battery, I tested the battery with a multimeter, and this battery is completely dead. We're also going to be replacing the battery when we have the power supply out. And the battery is also something that I offer on my website, synthchaser.com. So I will show you how to get the power supply out, and we'll rebuild it. So I'm going to show you how to get the power supply out now to rebuild it and replace the battery. Uh, there's several connectors that uh, you need to disconnect, but the most important connector to disconnect is the power. So completely unplug the synthesizer, uh, turn it off, make sure that there's no, uh, no power going to the synthesizer, and then we'll start disconnecting the, uh, the Molex connectors. So the first connector we're going to disconnect is this one in the back. This goes uh, from the transformer to the power supply board. This one they've marked with a pen the orientation of it so when you go to put it back it's, uh, it's, it's easy to remember which way it goes. Uh, you might consider doing the same with a Sharpie. Uh, the second connector we're going to unplug is this, uh, uh, this power connector here. It's a, a four, four pin Molex connector. One of them is a key. Uh, that takes the power to the uh, to the voice cards. Uh, the next one we're going to disconnect is this one right here, which is again a power distribution one. It connects the power to the control board there. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is disconnect the three voltage regulators that are on the heat sink on the back of the synthesizer. And there's color coded uh, color coded and keyed connectors here. So blue obviously will go back to blue and uh, there's, a, there's a key on this so you can only plug it in one way. So yellow and red. Uh, and then there's uh, four more connectors. There's four voltage regulators or transistors here on a little heat sink here and uh, there's a wires going to the connectors here. Uh, if they're not already numbered you should number them so you remember which way they go back in but the wire really will only reach uh, so far. So it would be very difficult to, uh, to mess that up. So I'm disconnecting those. And then there's uh, four screws that hold this board into the, into the case uh, in each corner. And I will unscrew those and then we can lift this out. So now I've got the power supply out and I'll proceed to uh, strip the capacitors. So I'm going to remove all the tantalum capacitors, these, uh, these ones here, and the four electrolytic capacitors. Uh, because the battery is dead and I'm going to be replacing it, I'm going to be removing the battery as well. This little bit of wire here is something that that, uh, that someone kind of glued into place to fit a smaller size battery. Uh, take care when you desolder the batteries that you don't apply heat for too long when you solder and desolder from the batteries because they can explode. They're lithium batteries and you definitely don't want them to explode. And then I'm also going to remove the two uh, bridge rectifiers. We're going to beef those up. Um, one thing you might want to do is when you take this out of your keyboard, particularly if you've used it recently, is try to just try to discharge the capacitors. So you take a screwdriver and uh, basically bridge the two leads of the capacitors. And if it was charged up, you'd hear a you'd hear a pop. Um, in this case, it it wasn't. Um, but uh, that that's just a safety precaution you can take. So I'm going to strip the power supply, and then we'll put the new parts in and go from there. And uh, while we have the power supply out, we're also going to pull out the control board because we're going to need to clean that up and repair the, the damaged sockets and chips and ICs. 
so to get this out, we just need to disconnect the cables uh, and uh, unscrew it. There's a lot of cables going to this board. The first one we're going to pull is this one going to the pot board. So it just comes out of this connector here. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to disconnect the uh, the uh, output jack wire, which is this connector here. We're going to disconnect the bender box, which is this connector here. Uh, and then we're going to disconnect all the connectors here, which go to the voice cards, uh, the voice card motherboards. So I've removed the uh, memory expansion, just disconnecting it from these sockets here and setting it aside. Uh, remove the standoff that that was installed on and unscrew two screws here. Now this will fold back and I can gently remove the connector for the keyboard. Just gently wiggle it loose so it doesn't get damaged. There we go. And set that aside. So now I'll be able to unscrew this board and take it out. I'm going to leave this, uh, this attached here. There's no connector here. This is soldered into place so we're going to have to work on this with the little daughter board installed. Now I've got the two boards out that I'm going to work on and I, I was able to take a look at the bottom of this board so there's some corrosion in this area and in this area and there is a little bit on the bottom of the board um, affecting some of these connectors and um, we're going to uh, remove uh, most of these components here and uh, here with the exception of these uh, tropical fish capacitors which we're going to try to save and uh, then we're going to neutralize the, uh, the base with some vinegar, which is uh, uh, an acid, so it'll neutralize the, the uh, mouse pee, which is what I think it is. Uh, and we'll do the same on the back of the board, and we'll wash the affected area and dry it really good. And then we'll put in all new sockets here. Uh, the chips that are, are, are corroded, we're going to replace those with new chips. So most of these op-amp chips are going to be replaced. Uh, with new ones and, and probably also a lot of these resistors are going to be replaced as well. I pulled the ICs from the sockets where there looked like there was corrosion and you can see that these IC sockets are just totally destroyed inside. They're, they're totally blue and corroded and uh, in some cases the little leaves of the IC socket are just, uh, just disintegrated when I pulled the chip. Uh, so I pulled all the chips uh, bordering the uh, the uh, uh, corroded area and you can see that as we get closer towards the edge of it you know maybe just the the inside pins of some are, are bad uh, but it looks like 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 chips uh, and sockets are, are going to be replaced so with the sockets removed, you can actually see that this uh, urine was uh, kind of collected under the dip sockets and uh, has been corroding away under there for some time. Um, it looks pretty nasty. And uh, honestly, it smells pretty nasty too when I was working on it. Um, so I'm going to remove also some of the passive components, the resistors um, down here look to be in pretty bad shape. and. If there's stuff uh, caught under here, then there's probably stuff caught under this big batch of resistors here. So I'll take those out and uh, then clean up the board. So I've got the power supply out and I've removed all the old parts which are up here and I've got the new parts ready to go in. I've cleaned the board of all the old flux residue. At some point someone had changed the batteries, uh, the battery, they kind of uh, wired uh, this battery that didn't fit to, to make it fit. Uh, but this battery no longer had any charge, so I'm going to be replacing it with a battery of the correct size and uh, pin footprint. Uh, one other thing I noticed was uh, there's these uh, tantalum capacitors, and uh, two of them were actually missing. So the power supply was missing two of its capacitors. So th this is the uh, this here is the kit that I sell on my website. It's uh, the OBX power supply rebuild kit. And uh, we're replacing the four filter capacitors and then these little decoupling capacitors. Uh, these capacitors that we're replacing, they have the same footprint. They fit right in the old spot, but they are, uh, number one, they're new, which is important to keep your synthesizer uh, running properly. Uh, they are higher voltage rating and a higher temperature rating than the old capacitors. Uh, so that means they're going to last longer and perform better. The bridge rectifiers, so these are the old bridge rectifiers, and they were one amp bridge rectifier. And the ones that we're putting in are six amp bridge rectifiers. These run way too hot. Um, 
oftentimes. And, and originally the factory mounted them right up, right down on the board most of the time. So there wasn't any like airflow to dissipate the heat. So these larger bridges are going to withstand, you know, heat at the current that it's uh, the synthesizer is pulling. It's going to not get as hot, and uh, we're going to mount it raised above the board a little bit so it'll dissipate the heat a lot better. And again, since the battery on this one was dead, we're going to change the battery while we have this out. I should also mention that I sell the power supply rebuild kit and the batteries on my website synthchaser.com. So here's a completed power supply board and uh, some tips uh, for installing this uh, kit. Make sure the polarity on all the capacitors is correct. So the arrow marks the negative side. You can mark down which side is which. I mean most of them are marked on the board. Um, but you can with a sharpie write on the board. You can take notes on a paper. Uh, whatever you want to do. These bridge rectifiers that are, are beefier just make sure that they're not touching the capacitors. You don't want to melt the casing of the capacitors or the wires next to it. And mount them with a little bit of space off the, uh, the bottom of the board so air can flow around it to, to cool it down. Uh, one final thing is if you are changing the battery, change the battery last. Because once you, start, once you put the battery in, it will start charging up these capacitors and then you don't want to be working on the board. Or it will start charging up the capacitor for the 5 volt rail. So you don't want to be working on the board at that point. Uh, so now the power supply is done, the battery is changed, and this is ready to go back in the synthesizer. So I've uh, completed rebuilding this area of corroded uh, circuit board. Uh, I replaced 18 socketed ICs. Uh, these up here, one underneath here, these, this row and this row cleaned the corrosion out from underneath. I also replaced this uh, section of resistors here, including these uh, metal film resistors that uh, were pretty corroded. So now we're ready to put the keyboard back together and, uh, and see if that eighth note uh, doesn't uh, squeak anymore. I've got the power supply reinstalled back in the synthesizer and I've made all the connections. It's really easy. They're keyed. You can't mess it up. Uh, so you connect the uh, transformer, the three off-board regulators or uh, transistors, and then these uh, four smaller ones uh, with, these, with these sockets here. Uh, one thing to note is uh, just make sure these wires here aren't touching these larger bridge rectifiers, uh, otherwise it will melt the insulation of the wires there. Uh, you know we're using the largest possible bridges that will fit here and as you can see they're in there they're not touching the capacitor they're not touching any of the wires there because uh, they will get hot um, but they'll get a lot less hot than the underrated bridges that were were there to begin with so the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna put the camera down and we're gonna uh, fire this up and we're gonna test to make sure all the rails are are present and correct before we connect it to any other part of the synthesizer so here I've got the power supply back in the keyboard, connected all the voltage regulators uh, here and here, connected the transformer, but I have not connected these two connectors, E and F, which connect to the rest of the keyboard. In fact, the control board is still, still not in there. Uh, but what I'm going to do first is I'm going to uh, uh, verify all the, the power rails on the power supply and dial in the adjustable rails as as, as best as you can without any load connected to it. Uh, so what I've done is I've connected uh, my meter here. Uh, there's only two rails that can be adjusted, but, uh, so we're going to look at those first, uh, the plus and minus 19 volt rails, and we'll get them dialed in as best as we can, and then we'll go through and verify the other rails, the 12 volt, 15 volt, 5 volt, and, and minus uh, rails of those too. Uh, I'm using these little mini grabbers. Uh, I have another video that shows you how to make these on the super cheap. Uh, my old ones broke, so I had to make some new ones. Um, and they, they let you just clip on to the header there, and then you can uh, dial in the rails and do with other things without having both your hands tied up holding your multimeter leads. So look for that video. So I've got this connected, and I'm going to fire up the keyboard now. Uh, I'll turn my multimeter on to DC volts. So I've turned it on. I've got uh, 
the positive lead connected on the first pin of connector F, and the, the negative lead, the ground lead, connected on the second pin of uh, connector F. This is the plus 19 volt rail, and I'm reading 21.5 volts. So I'm going to want to kind of turn that down a little bit. So uh, the trimmers, there's two trimmers here and here, uh, probably hard to see right now. Uh, one for the 19 volt, plus 19, and one for the minus 19. So I'm going to get this dialed in as well as I can. They're pretty sensitive. Uh, it's easy to uh, overshoot uh, with these single term trimmers. But I got that to 19.04. And uh, it, the service manual says that it should be plus or minus 0.2 volts. So if I have it at 19.04, that, that's probably as good as I'm going to get it. So now I'm going to move over and do the uh, the plus 15, or the, sorry, the minus 19 volt rail, which is the fourth pin, the only other pin on this connector here, this connector F. So I put my uh, my little uh, my little lead there, and I'm getting a negative 8.05 volts, so I'm way off on that. So uh, I'll turn the trimmer, and. Uh, Again, it's, you can get a huge range on this. You can get it all the way down to zero and uh, up to like 20-something volts just with half a turn of this trimmer. So now I've got this at uh, negative 19.07 volts, which is probably as, as good as it's going to get. So now we're going to just verify the other, uh, the other power rails that, that come off of this. So uh, E1 is our minus 5 volt rail, and that's... Uh, should be plus or minus a quarter of a volt, and it's minus 4.99 volts, which is good. Uh, the service manual, if you, even if you can't read schematics, the service manual on page 6 tells you what voltages you should be measuring at each pin on these connectors and what kind of tolerance. So I'm on E3 now, and I'm reading 12.05 volts, and this is a tw plus 12 volt rail, so that's good. So let's hop over to E4. I'm getting 5.05 sorry, 4.9, that's changing a little bit, settling on 4.86 volts. And this is a, uh, the 4.8 volt rail. This is the, uh, the, memory, uh, the memory backup uh, power rail. Uh, so we're going to verify this again with the power turned off. So I'm going to kill the power to the keyboard, and we'll let the uh, capacitors drain a little bit. Now I see the voltage is dropping. Basically, as long as this doesn't get below 2.3 volts, uh, you're going to be fine. In, in this case, I mean, it's going to gradually work its way down to the voltage of the battery, which is uh, three, 3 volts. So um, it's, it's kind of draining. Voltage is dropping now that the capacitors are draining. Uh, but I know that this is fine because I just changed the battery. Uh, so I'm turning this back on, and we're going to move to the next connector, which is E6. So we're skipping pin 5 and moving to pin 6. This is measuring 5.10 volts. This is the 5 volt rail, so that's good. Move on to E7. E7 is 15.14 volts. This is the plus 15 volt rail, so that's, that's good. And it's looking for... Uh, 750 millivolts tolerance on here, uh, so everything is within spec, and it's adjusted as, as well as we can, because we can't adjust these rails. And the last rail that we're going to look at is on connector E9. I went to E8, but it's actually E9. And uh, this is the minus 15 volt rail, and here we're at minus 14.53 volts. Um, if it were adjustable, I would obviously want to adjust it closer to fit minus 15 volts, but it's saying that the tolerance is uh, 700, plus or minus 750 millivolts. So uh, we're, we're within spec there. So we've gone through and we've calibrated the power supply, uh, verified the battery backup is, uh, is working, um, and we verified that all the power rails are present and correct before we connect the rest of the, the the power supply to the rest of the keyboard because we don't want to damage anything if um, something broke when we had the power supply out or if the keyboard wasn't working before if the power supply still isn't repaired we don't want to damage anything so we want to always verify this before we connect it 
uh, to a load. And these voltages may change once we connect it to a load, and that's fine. We'll recalibrate the 19 and minus 19 volt rails and re-verify all these rails that we just checked uh, once we get the keyboard uh, all put back together. But again, we want to make sure that it's safe before we, we do that. So now I'm going to power it down and uh, connect the uh, main control board in here. So I've connected the control board and made all the different connections to the motherboards with the voice cards, the control board, the bender board, the keyboard. And I uh, turn it back on and I had to readjust the 19 and minus 19 volt rails and I re-verified each of the other rails was, was still uh, present and correct. And uh, now we're ready to close this up and fire it up and test it out. So the problem we were having before was uh, one of the notes was squeaking, probably due to the uh, corroded and broken uh, leg of an op amp is what we thought, uh, due to the corrosion there on the board. So now it's not in tune, I haven't calibrated it yet, but there's no squeaking note and uh, it's responding to the controls. I'm going to run through everything and make sure it works properly. So the problem that I'm seeing is the uh, there's an aftermarket memory expansion uh, card in here and it doesn't seem to be working. So uh, I've created a patch on manual and I'm going to write the patch in and uh, it, it won't take that patch. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to remove that uh, that memory expansion product and uh, and see if the keyboard will retain its memory uh, in the factory state. So I've disconnected this uh, memory expansion product and I put back the integrated circuit that, that, that this replaced and uh, there's still no change I mean uh, the uh, it won't commit a, commit a patch to memory so I should hit right the light it lights up and then I hit A1 but it just goes back to whatever garbage is in the, is in the memory. Uh, so this needs a little bit more troubleshooting. So working on this memory uh, retention issue, uh, what I'm finding is, uh, so let's say we have the voice A3. Most of them sound like that. So now I'm going to put it in manual mode. And I'm going to try to write this to voice A3. And uh, now it sounds like this, instead of this. So there's either a problem writing all of the data, or uh, reading the data back. And uh, this uh, OBX uh, uses different memory structures on the different chips. The, the, the permanently saved memory is a uh, uh, one bit, I believe. Uh, let's see, yeah, uh, 1024 by 1 bit, and the, uh, the, the uh, memory, the scratch RAM memory is a uh, 256 by 4 bit, uh, or is that, sorry, uh, yeah, 256 by 4 bit. So it's possible that uh, one of these chips is bad, uh, causing part of the patch to be saved, and then when it's uh, when it's read into the the the, the scratch memory, its uh, data is changed. So we're gonna have to take a closer look at that. So through process of elimination, I found out which of the uh, memory chips is bad. It's one of the uh, the persistent memory chips, the one that's uh, maintained by the battery backup. Unfortunately, it's an obsolete chip. But the way that I figured out which which chip it was is I removed all four of the RAM chips. So. Uh, these chips here are the, the scratch memory. They're powered by the 5 volt rail. These four chips are the persistent memory. Uh, they are, they're a different structure than these chips, but they're uh, powered by the plus 5 memory line. So what I did is I yanked all four chips out so that the, the keyboard had no memory, and I turned it on and I jotted down what, what the, uh, the patch in A1 sounded like or what, it, what, what, the, what the settings on the panel were. And then I started adding chips back in one at a time and I would go to manual mode each time and I would uh, change the settings just to be as, as different from the, uh, the factory. So I'd just set it to be like a sine wave LFO oscillator 2 is on 
with a sawtooth. And then I would uh, try to commit it to patch A1. And I would see what got retained and, and what, what changed. So here this uh, sine wave changed back to square and this oscillator 2 uh, light lit up. So this is the bad RAM chip that I found. Um, so I, I'm going to pull this one out and I'll show you what happens if I put in the one that I think is, is good. So I'm going to pull out this bad chip and I'm going to put in the good chip back into this uh, position 3. This is IC112. So I turn the keyboard on. Obviously I can't rely on what's in the memory because it's, uh, I, I removed the chip. But I'll go back to manual mode. I'll set the same thing. Sign, uh, LFO, and a saw, oscillator 2. And I'll go and I'll write it into the uh, patch A1. And now you'll see that it kept sign and square is off. This was never lit. Um, so this, this, is, this is off. Um, whereas that was on just a second ago. Um, these obviously are, are in that fourth RAM slot, the one that I uh, only have a bad chip for. So at this point now I know I can order the, uh, this RAM chip. It's a 6508 RAM chip and that should fix saving patches to memory. So with the memory problem identified I went to uh, remove this memory expansion uh, which first of all it doesn't doesn't seem to do much good when it's uh, down inside the uh, inside the panel. You can't really switch between the banks. Um, but we need to get the uh, the onboard memory working before we can introduce this and see if that works. So I went to remove that um, and uh, was peeking down here at the uh, had to get the cable out from under the uh, the second uh, voice card tray, and I noticed this little burned mark here and I look down below and we have a tantalum capacitor that has exploded. So um, I'm going to take this voice card out and uh, clean that up. Replace the capacitor, uh, the resistors next to it. Uh, can't tell if they're just dirty or if they're burned up. Um, but we'll get that cleaned up and, uh, and, and test the voice card. And uh, once we're done with that, then the keyboard will be ready to go. So, yeah. So here I've uh, re recapped this, uh, this one voice card, the one that had the exploded capacitor here. Uh, so I didn't just change the one that blew up, I changed the one next to it. Uh, the uh, two axial capacitors and the output uh, capacitor. Uh, so these capacitors are included in a kit that I sell, uh, a voice card rebuild kit, which not only includes these capacitors, but also includes the trimmers uh, for the initial frequency of each oscillator. These uh, single turn trimmers are pretty much impossible to, to, to get the oscillators tuned. You nudge it even a tiny bit and it just way overshoots what you're intending. So I replaced the... Uh, the uh, initial frequency trimmers with uh, with multi-turn trimmers like this. Um, the uh, owner of this uh, normally at that point, yeah, normally I would recommend um, you know re recapping all of the voice cards. Um, you know, a lot of them st these still have their original aluminum electrolytic capacitors and aluminum uh, and original tantalum capacitors. So these are all just ticking time bombs, waiting for the same thing to happen that happened over here um, and when you replace the capacitors you needed to calibrate the voice cards again. Uh, in this particular case the owner wants to keep the cost of the repair to the minimum so I just recapped this one voice card um, but if your voice cards look like this with tantalum capacitors here, these are the little blobby looking capacitors and they have these uh, original looking electrolytic capacitors there you would want to pick up that voice card uh, rebuild kit and, and rebuild them all uh, to avoid something exploding. I mean, this one was right next to a Curtis chip. I mean, it didn't so, uh, electrically; it wasn't connected to the to the Curtis chip. But I mean, that was one of the um, the the uh, power rails for this whole board. So, uh, I mean, this this 
exploding tantalum capacitors can take out other chips with it and these chips are are valuable and you want to protect them and make sure that they last a long time so I would normally do that but uh, now we're gonna close everything up and we should be good to go I was in the process of buttoning this back up and one of the voices was out I opened it up and I see here voice 8 seems to always be on and uh, I took a look at it, the gate on this is, is, is floating. Uh, and I traced that back over here to these connections between the control board and the voice card motherboard. And uh, one of the wires here is broken. Um, these connectors are pretty bad to begin with. Um, you know, in 35 years they become, or 40 years, they become oxidized and don't make good contact. But also they were only crimped uh, in one place on the wire itself, not uh, on the wire and the insulation. So I'm going to crimp a new wire into this Molex connector, um, but I do sell a set of replacement connectors on my website, synthchaser.com. So I pulled the uh, the wire with a broken connector out, and I, I do stand corrected. It is crimped in two places, but um, nonetheless it's still broke, and we're going to replace the whole wire. So now we've closed it up, and... Uh... We've completed the repair of this uh, Oberheim OBX, and uh, what we did is uh, this was completely dead when it got here. We, I uh, uh, had previously resolved a short that was uh, preventing it from working, and pulling down the voltage rails. Uh, we got inside and we found, uh, we identified a bad memory chip. We need to order a replacement or um, the owner might put in a magnetic RAM board. Uh, there was one squeaking note, uh, which ironically was due to a damage from a mouse uh, so we cleaned up the uh, the mouse urine that had corroded the board and uh, um, uh, replaced a lot of the chips and and uh, and resistors uh, we rebuilt the power supply and changed the battery and we found uh, uh, an exploded capacitor on one of the voice cards and replaced it. What we didn't do here is obviously we didn't finish the memory fix because the chip is obsolete so I need to either order the chip uh, or, or come up with a, some kind of replacement. Uh, and I didn't rebuild all the voice cards. Uh, normally I would, I would do that. Rebuild the voice cards and uh, um, uh, change the trimmers and, and do a full calibration um, to get this uh, working great for a long time to come. Uh, but we did bring this OBX back to life and uh, hopefully it serves its owner well for many years to come. Uh, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com thanking you for watching and uh, be sure to subscribe to my channel for more synthesizer repair type videos. Bye. <laughs>